provided by. In our ET birthdays, which actor comedian? Now. An emergency meeting of the city council this morning, the latest on the coronavirus and the unanswered questions about the quarantine at JBSA Lackland. It's official coronavirus, now a pandemic. Who makes the official call and exactly what constitutes a pandemic? Biden's big wins on Super Tuesday number two, making the fight for the Democratic presidential nomination much more difficult for Bernie Sanders. We have the analysis and the implications coming up. It was a beautiful day out there, and this nice spring-like weather will continue for most of spring break. But we do have to talk about rain chances in our near future. I'll be back with a look at your forecast coming up. Plus, that old dishwasher may be humming along just fine, but we're going to show you why getting a new one could save you money. Spring break extended for students at local colleges and universities. Why students are getting an extra week off due to fears of the coronavirus. The News at 5 starts right now. COVID-19 now officially recognized as a pandemic. The World Health Organization making that call today. So what exactly constitutes a pandemic? Well, there are three general factors taken into consideration. A virus that causes illness or death, sustains person-to-person -person transmission, and has spread throughout the world. According to the Centers for Disease Control, a pandemic differs from an epidemic based on the number of people infected and where those cases are occurring. As of today, the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 has surpassed 121,000 cases across the globe. More than 4,300 people have died and more than 66,000 people have recovered. Among those cases, more than 1,000 have been confirmed in the U.S. and more than 30 deaths and eight recoveries have been reported. And we have breaking news now on a change in the arrival of more Grand Princess, Princess cruise ship passengers at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland for a federal quarantine. The first plane load of 98 passengers arriving last night and they are currently being housed at JBSA Lackland. Garrett Berger has just learned that there are going to be some big changes in how that quarantine is handled. He joins us now live from Kelly Field where the passengers are expected to land the remaining ones. That's right, just minutes ago, we heard in a change on how the quarantine is going to be working here at JBSA Lackland. Whereas a plane arrived yesterday carrying passengers from the Grand Princess, we're now hearing that instead of another plane arriving today, as we expected, we could be seeing several planes coming in over the next day or two. The idea in this is to shuffle around the evacuees until there are only Texan evacuees here at JBSA Lackland. That follows a decision by the governor's office to only allow Texans into state and local health facilities out of the JBSA Lackland quarantine. Whereas before all of the quarantine, all of the people who were in quarantine who tested positive for the coronavirus were going for the going to the Texas Center for Infectious Disease. The governor has now said that only Texans will be allowed in there. He said yesterday or rather his office said that he received confirmation yesterday or assurance from HHS yesterday that only Texans would be allowed to state or local health facilities so that it non Texans wouldn't take away any health resources from the state's residents in the case of a local outbreak or any other health concerns. So that means rather than having a lot of evacuees from all over the country here at Lackland and then going out uh, once their quarantine is finished, we would only have Texans here at Lackland. We're still trying to figure out the rest of the details, but we'll bring you those once we have them. Live at Kelly Field, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Local college students getting one more week of spring break today. The Alamo Colleges, Texas A&M, San Antonio, UTSA, Trinity University and St. Mary's University all announcing campuses will be closed for at least one more week to prepare for the coronavirus. As of today, classes for all of the colleges and universities are expected to resume on March 23rd. UTSA and Texas A&M San Antonio say at that point all classes will be taught online. St. Mary's University says it is preparing staff to possibly do the same. As for Our Lady of the Lake and the Incarnate Word, according to their websites, they are monitoring the virus, but they have not yet announced any changes. Trinity is also asking students not to return to their dorms, only to pick up their belongings. 
A student can file an exemption if they have nowhere to go. Meanwhile, CPS Energy says it is suspending energy disconnects in response to fears over COVID-19. That means for the time being, customers who fall behind because of concerns about paying their bills in person will not have their services interrupted. CPS reminds customers there are many ways to make payments, including by mail, phone, or online. They're also available to respond to non-bill related issues, either by phone or online as well. You can find more information about your options posted at ksat.com. The changes are coming fast and furious. There's another major Texas event that has been canceled. The Houston Rodeo shutting down in response to COVID-19 concerns. According to our sister station, KPRC, the rodeo grounds themselves were closed about an hour ago, 11 days early. Houston city officials making the announcement this morning after one case was confirmed in Montgomery County and it was not travel related. It was community based. It's one of about 14 cases reported in the Houston area. Health officials believe the person diagnosed in Montgomery County, County attended the rodeo barbecue cook off on February 28th. It's unclear if that person was experiencing symptoms at the time. Right now, doctors are trying to retrace that person's steps. The rodeo is scheduled or rather was scheduled to run through March 22nd. Back here at home now, the Tejano Music Awards fanfare is still going on as planned. The event kicks off tomorrow at Market Square and is expected to run through Sunday afternoon. Organizers say they're monitoring the coronavirus alongside the city, and for now they plan to have hand washing stations and Purell stations throughout Market Square for all attendees. Food and beverage vendors are required to wear gloves. You'll find a full lineup of the entertainment right now on KSAT.com. Meantime, one of the most popular sporting events in the country will now be played without its fans. In an unprecedented move today, the NCAA has decided to ban fans from both the men's and the women's tournament games. Yeah, that decision announced by NCAA President Dr. Mark Emmert due to the ongoing coronavirus. With more on this decision and what awaits the NBA, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. All right, thank you very much. This is something we've never seen in sports, and as we speak, the NBA is deciding on whether or not to do exactly the same thing with games left in the regular season. The decision to ban all fans from the NCAA tournament comes in the wake of Ohio Governor Mark DeWine's decision to ban fans from the regional tournaments being played in Cleveland and Ohio. In a statement, Dr. Emmert says he understands how disappointing this is for all our fans of our sports, but his decision is based on the current understanding of how COVID-19 is progressing in the United States. States, adding the decision is in the best interest of public health, including that of the coaches, administrators, fans, and most importantly, our student athletes. Besides the team's essential personnel and some family members will be allowed to attend. The NBA is also considering a similar move for the remainder of the regular season and meeting with the NBA Board of Governors this afternoon right now. Something the Golden State Warriors have already announced they will do starting tomorrow against the Nets. First players were asked what it would be like to play home games without their fans. No doubt it will. I mean, you know, the, the crowd, especially a home team, um, you have that advantage of, of being able to play in front of thousands and thousands of people. So no doubt no one in, in the stands. It will definitely make uh, somewhat of an impact. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if we got to do that, we got to do that. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Um, I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever played a game without any fans there. So, um, I mean, I've seen a lot of people say, uh, this is what we play for, and I mean, being in an empty gym would be kind of weird, so I don't know how anybody would feel about that. All right, coronavirus protocols for the NBA went into effect on Tuesday, closing the locker room to all media and forcing reporters to stay at least six feet from players. We'll have more on this breaking news coming up in sports, Ursula. A lot happening. Thank you so much, Greg. If you have questions about the coronavirus, specifically about the Joint Base San Antonio Lackland's health protection efforts, you'll have a chance to get your answers tonight. We first told you about the virtual town hall yesterday when it was originally scheduled, but now JBSA military leaders have rescheduled it. It is tonight at six o'clock. You can submit your questions during a live broadcast on JBSA's Facebook page. And just to make sure that you include town hall question in your subject line. Again, the virtual town hall being streamed on JBSA's Facebook page starts tonight at six. Turning to some other news now, we now know the name of a 63-year-old man who was killed while crossing 281 last month. He has been identified as David Allen Rose. San Antonio police say back on February 26th, Rose was attempting to cross 281 near Wurzbach Parkway when he was hit by a driver. That person did stop and no charges were filed. 
The Bear County Democratic Party has already done it. And tonight, the Republican counterpart will be canvassing the results of the 2020 primary. And once both parties have finished this canvassing, the elections office will likely release final results tomorrow. But there may be an issue. Yesterday, local party chair Cynthia Bream threatened not to certify the results because of what she says were alleged discrepancies in the election. She says results should be thrown out and there needs to be another election. We asked a Trinity University political scientist if that was the case. I can't imagine a situation that would provoke that barring, uncovering some sort of malfeasance. <laughs> That would mean there would have to be wrongdoing, especially by a public official. The Texas Secretary of State's office tells us it would be up to a judge to decide whether to vacate those results and then call another election. A look at how often that happens coming up tonight at six. Meantime, oh, what a night for Joe Biden. Voters on Super Tuesday 2 put Biden in the driver's seat for the Democratic nomination. But while Bernie Sanders is down, he says he's not out, not just yet. Whitney Wilde breaks down the results and repercussions of Super Tuesday 2. Bernie Sanders knows Jill Biden is taking control of the Democratic race for president. Last night, obviously, was not a good night for our campaign from a delegate point of view. Biden easily defeated Sanders in Michigan, a state where the Vermont senator stunned Hillary Clinton four years ago. We are losing. The debate over electability. The crucial general election battleground state is the latest in a string of primary wins for Biden in one of the most sudden and dramatic rebounds in modern political history. It's more than a comeback, in my view, our campaign. It's a comeback for the soul of this nation. Now Biden is building a powerful coalition of African Americans, people in the suburbs and rural white voters who previously backed Sanders. I want to thank Bernie Sanders and his supporters for their tireless energy and their passion. Sanders is entering a brutal stretch with primaries next week in Arizona, Florida, Illinois, and Ohio, all states he lost in 2016. But the senator says he's staying to make sure his movement keeps its voice in the campaign. We are winning the generational debate. Today, I say to the Democratic establishment, in order to win in the future, you need to win the voters who represent the future of our country. In Washington, I'm Whitney Wild reporting. Well, there's a lot going on in the news world, certainly, but in the weather world, just a pretty nice day out there for us with temperatures in the low to mid 80s. It feels great and it feels like springtime. I do want to go ahead and take a look at the weather watchers because I want to show you these warm temperatures out in Eagle Pass, 88 degrees, Talia's backyard, 89 in Warren's backyard out in Del Rio, 85 in Shirts, 90 in Floresville, closer to San Antonio, 83 in Windcrest, 87 in Mico and 87 in Bandera. We're going to continue the stretch of nice weather before rain works its way back in the forecast. Your forecast coming up soon. Thank you, Sarah. Up next at five, if you're hanging on to a year's old dishwasher simply because it still gets the job done, what newer models have to offer that might make you consider going out with the old and in with the new, it's next. Taking a look at the stock market, another rough day on Wall Street. The Dow closing 1464 below. NASDAQ also down 392. S&P also down 140.85. You know the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, I said the word ain't on the air. I'm not supposed to. You may feel that way, though, about your old dishwasher. But 12 on your sides, Marilyn Morris says a new dishwasher may just save you water and money. Girls, come empty the dishwasher, please. The biggest problem is having the dishwasher emptied. 
Despite the battles, the Claire family is glad the dishwasher keeps humming along. My dishwasher is over 13 years old and we don't plan on replacing it anytime soon. It's wise to get the most out of your appliances, but if you are on the fence, Consumer Report says there are a lot of reasons to consider a new dishwasher. Today's dishwashers just cost less to run. If your dishwasher is more than eight years old, a new one could use 15% less electricity and 20% less water. Today's dishwashers are also more effective when it comes to tackling your dirty dishes, and that's because many come with soil sensors. Soil sensors scan the water at the beginning of a cycle and automatically adjust the wash cycle depending on how much grime it detects. CR says with soil sensors, resist the urge to pre-rinse your dishes. Instead, just scrape off the big bits of food. Pre-rinsing actually tricks the dishwasher into thinking that your dishes are cleaner than they actually are, so it could cut the cycle short, leaving your dishes kind of dirty. Manufacturers have also addressed another big gripe, wet dishes. Manufacturers have come up with a bunch of ways to get dishes drier. One of the ways is to have the door automatically open to release steam and speed up evaporation. If you're ready to buy a new one, CR says a best buy is this Bosch Ascenta for $500. It cleans and dries and is easy on the energy. Marilyn Moritz, KSET 12 News. Finally, a day full of sunshine on this week of spring break. We could all use a little sunshine. And a lot of oak. Oh, yeah. yeah well, Unfortunately, <laughs> oak season, we're about to peak in oak season. And uh, I just want to remind people with everything with COVID-19 that's going on, if you have allergies, you may think, oh, man, I'm sick. Do I have COVID? If you don't have a fever from allergies, so just keep that in mind. But I do want to show you the uh, allergy season here and, and when we peak in oak. We peak in late March and early April. Today's pollen count was high uh, for oak at 640 pollen grains per cubic meter of air. So again, we're approaching the peak of oak season. You'll start to see those oak trees uh, get those uh, little uh, catkin things that hang off of the trees and start to drop. And so that will be really extremely peak oak season early in April. So keep that in mind. We're about to enter into oak season, but the weather otherwise has been just beautiful today. It's 85 degrees outside and we've got high humidity at dew point at 61 degrees. Southeast wind gusting up to about 15 miles per hour, 10 to 15 mile per hour wind. So it is a very nice day out there. We started off with areas of fog, but we quickly saw the sun shine through and that's been the case pretty much for the uh, rest of the day since about lunch hour we've been able to see tons of sunshine wider view here even more sunshine experience south uh, along highway uh, part of me i-35 so because of that temperatures down in Catula right now in laredo 92 degrees 90 in Carrizo springs 90 in del rio a very warm spring-like day across all of the ksat 12 viewing area in the low 80s up in the hill country 81 in rock springs 82 in kerrville we are about 5 to 10 to even 15 degrees warm than how we were this time yesterday, all because we saw the sun a little quicker. Now tomorrow, we won't see the sun quite as quickly, but we will be able to warm up really nicely tomorrow as well. So let's take you through the planning forecast. Early tomorrow morning, you'll notice that fog will develop a lot like this morning, and we'll hang on to those clouds slightly longer than what we did uh, today, but just know that it'll still be a warm one with a high temperature in the low 80s just about everywhere you look. It is so nice outside that you may want to go out to the pool. For your poolside forecast, just know that the UV index will be high, but not that bad because we will have a little bit more clouds out there. Morning clouds clearing in the afternoon, 82 degrees for the high temperature south wind at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Let's take a quick check of your weather setup. We have got plenty of moisture coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, so we've got one of the ingredients for rain. On top of that, we've got a decent amount of Pacific moisture streaming in from the Pacific Ocean itself. So what gives? We haven't seen that much rain. Well, you need upper level support. You need energy to move into play. And that energy is currently off of the coast of Baja, California, and that'll be making its way towards San Antonio by the end of the weekend, providing that energy, tapping into that Pacific moisture and that Gulf of Mexico moisture. And so we'll see our storm chance slowly start to tick up during the weekend and into early next week. Now, it's not a great chance. It's still only isolated, about 30% chance for storms, but those storms could be boomers with plenty of thunder and lightning possible with any storms that develop. Up. So just to summarize, morning fog tomorrow, 82 degrees in the afternoon. It's going to be a warm one, not quite as warm as today, but definitely warm enough. Then on Friday, near 80 degrees with an isolated shower storm.
storm possible. Uh, more isolated to scattered storms throughout the weekend and into early next week. And just about every day, temperatures will be near 80 degrees. St. Patrick's Day looks to be pretty good, too. Nice and spring-like in the next uh, seven days of the forecast. All right. I hope we get a little rain out of all that. I hope so, too. Ursula. Thank you. NCAA has pulled the plug on fans. Now we await the NBA. You, they say you live long enough, you see it all. Well, right. I've seen it all. I've never yeah. seen March Madness play without fans. I've never seen an NBA game, specifically the Spurs games, play without fans. Right now, that is a strong possibility at the NCAA pull the plug on March Madness. When we come back, more about that and a much needed win for the Spurs when we come back. The NCAA decided to ban fans from March Madness today. The NBA Board of Governors holding a conference call today to discuss with Commissioner Adam Silver a number of options in the wake of the coronavirus, one of which includes playing games without fans, something the Golden State Warriors have decided to already do. The new coronavirus protocol already closed locker rooms and clubhouses to all non-essential personnel, including front office employees and the media, not just the NBA, but the National Hockey League, Major League Baseball, and Major League Soccer. It also includes the end of autograph and photo sessions for the fans starting last night, and now there's even talk of moving moving games to possible neutral sites to avoid cities who have more of an outbreak than others. The Spurs were asked if they could envision playing games without fans in the stands. It's unthought of, but, you know, you have to do what you have to do to, you know, try to take care of, you know, people and, you know, keep everyone healthy. You know, I mean, it wouldn't be ideal, but, you know, it's a business and, you know, everyone's health is important, so you got to do what you have to do. All right, while the fans are in the stands, the Spurs pulled off a much-needed win against their I-35 rivals to keep their slim playoff hopes alive and avoid a season sweep by the Dallas Mavs for the first time in franchise history. They're missing the last six games with a sore right shoulder. LaMarcus Aldridge made his return last night with a statement from the start. Derek White with a bounce pass to LaMarcus for the dunk. Marco Bellinelli also back there missing the entire road trip with an illness. He was on fire. Check out this contested three over Boban Marjanovic, and the Spurs are within two after one, 29-27. The Mavs will get as much out to an 11 point lead as Luka Doncic played after being questionable with a sprained right wrist. He would finish with a whopping 38, but Lamarck was just on a roll and the jumper helped get the Spurs within five at halftime. The Spurs would go up by as many as 13 as Lamarcus leads the comeback with a 10-0 run to get the Spurs within three. The Spurs would open the fourth on an 18-5 run with Lamarcus setting the screen for Belly and the Spurs now lead by 11. Marco was 16 off the bench, but the story last night was Lamarcus. DeMar to Aldridge for the two-handed slam, then the jumper from the key to lead the Spurs at 24 and the 119 to 109 victory. We just stayed the course. I thought, you know, that we had a lot of guys play well, but I thought everyone was competitive and physical, uh, and they just kept going. We need to get out the habit of digging ourselves a hole, but, you know, we stuck with it. We played aggressive on both ends. Um, we made mistakes here and there. We didn't let that frustrate us at all. In our seasons dwindling down. Um, if we want to keep, keep playing, we got to play with that sense of desperation, um, compete every night, and um, get on a run here. Doesn't get easier. 19 games left. Denver up next Friday at 7.30 if fans are allowed to go to the games. We'll keep you up to date on that. Oh, Strange man. days. Mm -hmm. Thanks, right. Craig. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for watching the News at 5 with us. World News is next. Hope to see you back here at 6.